I want to welcome all of His Glory Nation from east to west to north to south. We bring you the latest teaching in the Torah. Tonight we will be in Exodus 3. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is our Savior Christ the Lord. Okay, so we're picking up the Torah. The Torah is a holy book in three world religions. As we've mentioned before, the Torah is considered holy in Islam. And we're going to show you uh, those of uh, Muslim uh, following in Islam who this I am that I am is truly is. His name is Elohim in the original Hebrew, the God of three. We're going to show you how this matches the Gospels where Jesus claimed that he is the I am that I am. Seven times. Seven is the number of completion in the Bible. So there's a lot of connections here. Every part of the, the, the Torah points to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God, and God in the second, he in the second head. So uh, again, this is a considered holy book by Islam, obviously Judaism, and Christianity. We're going to get to the point here where Moses is going to meet the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as we've taught before, God's word is, uh, all, God's word is according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all God's word is God-breathed for our edification and our, for our doctrine. That doesn't mean just the, the New Testament. That doesn't just mean the Old Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, and the New Testament, or the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. So we need to make sure that we understand all 66 books to put God's integrated message system together. And once we do, we see Jesus Christ is literally on all the pages of the Torah. And uh, we'll get, in, get into that. We're showing you in uh, the Hebrews, uh, the book of John especially, and even the name that the Lord calls himself in the Hebrew. Okay, let's get into it. Exodus 3, this is where Moses is going to meet the Most High God. Uh, now Moses was tending flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Remember, we were talking about Exodus 2. He... Uh, was, was chased out because of the death of an Egyptian man, and the Hebrews found out, Pharaoh found out, Pharaoh wanted his head. We, we splashed in a little bit of the book of Yasser to tell you that uh, Jethro was, a, uh, was one of Pharaoh's uh, spiritual, demonic spiritual of the, of the false gods, and uh, that the, in the book of Yasser that uh, he actually put Moses into uh, a, a, a prison um, for 10 years, and uh, his, his wife-to-be supported him. So here we're at the end of this. Now he's gone through his trials and tribulations. He's now going to meet the most high God and God is going to give him his purpose. And that's what we have to do in our walk as well. God puts us through a wilderness period. We don't see it in detail in the book of Genesis as we do in the book of Yasser. Moses went through some serious wilderness. He was locked in a cage for 10 years. And 10 is always the number of, of commandments and um, uh, judgment and Moses was singing hymns is what the b book of Yasser tells us that what Moses was doing when he was in captivity and so then God used him through that wilderness period to get ready to to bring the Israelites back to the land God promised to Abraham Isaac and Jacob God never forgets his 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 anointed God never forgets his people and God always listens to the cry of of the righteous and righteous is not based on what we do in works the righteousness only can become from our faith in the Most High through His beloved Jesus Christ. So, the flock of Jethro and the priest of Midian. So, he was a priest of Midian, which was up underneath Pharaoh at that time, uh, or from before. Uh, we don't know if he went into uh, retirement and went out to Midian at this point, because this was a new Pharaoh. And he led the flock of the back of the de desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of Elohim. We're going to use the proper term here in the Hebrew because the name God gets thrown uh, liberal, liberally all over the place. God can be the God of the Hindus. God can be Allah. God can be, uh, God can be the God of yourself. God can be a spiritual God that you can create your own being and universalism and become like a God. Uh, there are lots of cults out there, a lot of false gods, a lot of Molochs, a lot of uh, Baals, a lot of asterisks. The term here in the original Hebrew is Elohim, the God of the Torah. And that, in grammatically correctly, in Hebrew, does not mean one, and it doesn't mean two, and it doesn't mean four. It can only mean three. So when you see your English version of this, uh, God created man in our image, it should say, well, wait a minute, well, our, who, why is it plural? Because the original word Elohim is plural. Here in the English vocabulary, we may have plural. We may say, 
you know, I would like a couple M&Ms. Well, a couple, maybe two, and maybe three, and maybe five. And it's my case, if you get M&Ms around me, it could be three bags of them. Um, that's why I got to stay away from M&Ms. But in Hebrew, Elohim, the exact word means only three. It can't mean anything else. So this is the God of Elohim. And we're going to see here as a, a, an expositional constancy in a, in a moment. that this is, this is God, yes. But this is God in the second head that's coming up. And Jesus is going to confirm that in the Gospel of John with seven I am statements. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. This is the burning bush. So he looked up and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So imagine Moses coming out and seeing this immaculate, uh, this amazing thing where this bush is burning internally and it's not, it's not burning up. And that is God outside of a dimensionality. That's God through a supernatural having this burn to, to get Moses' attention and show the glory of the Most High God. Uh, but here the angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord is an expositional constancy. Again, expositional constancy is a fancy theological term to say that the Holy Spirit is always consistent with its idioms, its colors, its numbers, and its symbols. An angel of the Lord is a Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. It's called a thanopony. Theo coming in from the three, the three of them in one. As, as uh, when Abraham went to see, uh, the, where the Lord came to see him with the two angels before Sodom and Gomorrah, that was a thanopony as well. That was Jesus Christ telling uh, Sarah that she would be with child. We see uh, the battle of Jericho when, when Joshua came up with an angel of the Lord. That was Christ. That was, the, that was the Messiah. And we're going to see how detailed God's word here is in a, in a minute. So this is none other than Jesus Christ and is the form of, of God and the burning bush. And Jesus confirms that in, uh, in, in the, the book of John seven times. That's why there's seven I am statements. I am meaning who he's going to call himself. I am that I am is what his name is. Uh, verse 3, then Moses said, I will turn aside and see the great sight. Why does this bush not burn? So when Jehovah saw, the t saw that, he turned aside to look. Uh, um, uh, Elohim called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And the word here in the, here in the Hebrew, uh, the English is not translating properly. He means Moses saying, I'm right here. It's, he's not saying here I am. It's, it's an English translation. We'll go to the exact word that God uses as I am that I am. And it's very precise. And it gives you a symbol of what Christ has said in the book of John, the book of Hebrews, all over the Old Testament and all over the New Testament, no, showing that God is in a three hat. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as King David said in Psalm 2. It was amazing where the, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are talking to each other in unison on their different roles in Psalm 2 by King David. Amazing. Um, so then he said, do not draw near this place. Uh, take off your sandals, off your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. So that was a custom in, the, in, in ancient the Middle East that you take your shoes off before you went into somebody's house because they were dirty. Uh, you know, our great grandparents used to do that too. We 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 don't do it as much as we we, we used to. But your feet were with sandals and they were dirty, so they would take you would take your shoes off as a sign of respect. But this goes far deeper than that. This is the second time that this has been a set. This is the first one, and then Joshua is going to hear the same thing: take your sandals off because you are on uh, holy ground. That was the angel of the Lord before Jericho, knowing that that's the same one that Moses heard from. So Joshua remembered that, thinking this is more than an angel of the Lord. This is none other than the, the Messiah, the Christ, God in the second head. And also this refers to the kinsman redeemer. And ancient in the, in the Torah, as we will we, come up to, and when you take the shoe off, that's how you redeem the land. So this is pun intended that he, he, they, Moses was not able to redeem the land. He was going to be part of the land and take them to the land of milk and honey. But the kinsman redeemer is the only one that can take the shoe off and redeem it for the land deed. And that's none other than Jesus Christ. Remember when John the Baptist says, uh, asked him, who are, you? who are you? Are you Elijah? No, I'm not Elijah. Are you the, the, the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. Are you the one that Moses talked about, referring to the Christ, the, more, than, more than a prophet? And Moses is showing us signs and symbols throughout all of Exodus of, of the Christ. Everything he does with the Passover will re reflect the Most High God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And he says, no, 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 I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. 
That wasn't a figure of speech. He was being literally mean. I am not the kingsman redeemer. There is one behind me that's greater. And I shall be least and he shall be higher. He is the one that can redeem the, the land deed. He is the one that can take his sandal off as in the book of Ruth and Boaz who redeemed the land for the dual covenant of Ruth representing the church and Naomi representing the nation of Israel, God's redemption. Uh, then he said, do not near this place. Take your sandals off for your place. You stand in holy ground. Verse six, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. So no person has ever seen the face of God the Father. Many have seen the face of Christ. We don't know exactly what he, whether he was looking toward God uh, in the, the form of Jesus Christ, but we do know later on in the Torah that God the Father allowed himself to pass by and Moses had to hide his face in the cleft of a rock because the glory of the Lord would just be too much for uh, any man to see. No man has ever seen uh, the, the, the face of the Father, only the Son, Jesus Christ. And as Paul says in his, his epistles, Jesus is the visible of the invisible God. So they work hand in hand in unison and becoming one and three, as we'll see. Um, so uh, the, the other most interesting thing here is what Jesus referred to in the book of John. He's, he, 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 the Pharisees were talking to him and saying, well, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are, are dead. And he, 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 that's their God? And no, Jesus said, they're the, he, they're the God of the living. And he goes into, to, to, to quote this exactly to show it's grammatically correct. It says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He didn't say, I was the God. He says, I am the God. That means they're living. They're with me. They're in, at this particular time, Abraham's bosom, which was a gulf between Sheol and uh, and uh, the paradise, which Jesus talked about before the resurrection of the living Christ. He is the God of the living. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are very much alive. And the, now God is going to f fulfill his, his covenant, that everlasting covenant to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land covenant, which the land covenant, covenant needs the shoe to redeem the land. It is exactly the way it, it was and is in the book of Ruth through Boaz. He was a type of Christ. He was a foreshadowing, and he was literally in the line of the tribe of Judah. And Boaz, we see, was great-grandfather of King David, and the Messiah comes in the line of King David. Everything God does is precise and accurate. And Exodus in the Torah is screaming of Jesus Christ every single page, screaming of his glory, and hallowed be his name. And the Lord said, uh, I surely have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. They, are, they, they have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Um, we'll get into deeper what the book of Yasser talks about when uh, uh, Moses comes in and they make, Pharaoh makes their work harder and what they literally did in the book of Yasser, which is worse than what the book of Genesis tells us about this. But God says he heard the cry of his people and he didn't forget. It was the, 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 the censor bowls get, re reached him. And now he's going to act and he's going to be, use a deliverer. He says, God, remember, God says in the Torah he, or through in the, old, in the prophets and uh, in, in Amos, he says, God does not do anything unless he tells his bondservants, the prophets first. He's always working through his anointed. He's always working through his prophets to get his purpose done. Now he's using Moses who was preordained from the face of, from the beginning of the earth. Moses had a, a, a purpose, and God is now going to show him that purpose because Moses was tried in the fire, literally. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land to, to a good and large land and, and, and that is flowing with milk and honey. That's the area he was telling his people, I will give you the land of milk and honey. And we will see later on that when um, Moses sent in 10 or 12 uh, spies, Ten came back with horrible things saying, uh, it's beautiful land, but the gigantes there, they, we can't beat them. But uh, Joshua and Caleb came and says, with God with us, we can overcome all things because our God is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that showed them favor. And that was reason why Caleb and Joshua were the only two of that generation were able to go into the land of milk and honey. This was the area promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. And when God says he'll do it, he will do it. And uh, so the land in the, the, were the place of the Canaanites, the, Hitt, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. 
So for all those Palestinians who think the Palestinian land, God is telling us here in the Torah, which the Torah is supposed to be holy in the book of the Quran, whose land is this? It's the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How long? Forever. God is saying it right here. The God, the God of Moses all over the place. And uh, so much so we mentioned before Habas, the, the head of the Palestinians. There's so much evidence to show that the Israelites uh, had, had uh, King David's uh, um, ar archaeology to show that the, the, the city of David was there, and that they were in the temple. Uh, there was no denying that the Jews were there, and that's the land of the Jews and the temple is the Jews. So he changed his story and said, we're now Canaanites to try to go back to the original owners of the particular land. Well, whether he's a Canaanite or not, it's still God's land that he's giving through the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses is going to lead them to that promised land. And that land will be forever. Thus says the Most High God, period. End of discussion. I didn't say it. He said it. And what he says is truth because his word is above his name. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. I have also seen the oppression which the Egyptians oppressed, seeing how horrible the Egyptian taskmasters were. And again, it was worse than that. They were, they were killing the children and putting the children inside the bricks when, when Pharaoh made their work even harder. And that was part of the, 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 uh, the city of Jericho, too. They were hiding babies uh, to their false gods inside the walls, and it was perverse. That's why God had the, the walls of Jericho fall down that were, backwards so that you could, they, they were exposed. And that was to show the, adult, the, the idolatry to a false god through human sacrifice of, of, of babies. God is, detests that the God of Moloch and all these false gods. That's why Satan always works in destroying the youth, destroying the babies. Why is Satan doing that? Because he's of evil and he's trying to destroy the line of, of God's anointed. But little, little does Satan know in his, in, in his intellect that God has conquered through his son Jesus Christ. He lost the battle on Calvary. But Moses said to God, Elohim, who am I that I should, verse 10, come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So he's saying, I'm sending you back to Pharaoh where you, you, were, you had to run out of the land. And Moses is saying, whoops, uh, maybe I don't really want to take on this, this role. Um, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I've sent you. When God says, I will surely be with you, you know he's never going to leave you. You know he's got you in your hands. And when you accept his son, Jesus Christ, today as Lord of your life, he'll never let you go. He has the, he has the number of, hair, your, of your hair numbered. He holds you in his hand and will never let you go. Even though the world looks hard. He's got it, and he will protect you always. He was with Moses every step of the way, even when Moses thought it was bleak. And when you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve uh, Elohim on this mountain. Moses said to Elohim, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? What should I call you? In Judaism, they don't even pronounce the name of God. If they say it, you'll see a big G, and if they do it in English, a dash, and then D. And then they do the unpronounceable Yahweh, and just put the four letters, and the four letters have a numerical value of 31. 31 in the Hebrew is the numerical value of God. His name is so strong, and this is where you're going to get it, get it uh, 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 Yaha, in a minute. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus shall say to the children, I am has sent me to you. Uh, yaha, yaha is the the actual Hebrew word, getting the 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 root of Yahweh, and to be, to become, to come to pass, to exist, to happen, to fall out. Those are the the exact Hebrew uh, in the Hebrew meaning of the word. So he is everything. He was, he is, and he is to come. He is all things. He was before the world, and he is the beginning. He is the end. Exactly what the Scripture tells us in uh, Hebrews 13, 18, showing Christ. Christ is the, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's not just a figure of speech that I believe the, the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. He's saying Christ was be in the beginning, and he is today, and he is yet to come. We see that in the Revelation. Who are you? I was the one that was dead, but I was, and I am, and I'm the one to come. That is the beginning and the end, the elf, the tau. That, that, that is God in the form of Jesus Christ 
in this in this case. And we see this in John 1.1. 1, 1. Who in the beginning was the Word. And the Word uh, was in the beginning, so before the world, the Word was with God and the Word was God. So the Word was next to God and the Word was God. So he was God and next to him and the Word became flesh, as the Apostle John tells us. None other than the Son of God, Jesus Christ, taking on the second head of the God. Uh, the Word became flesh, as Paul says, the visible of the invisible God. Again, the, Old, the New Testament revealing what was not known completely in the Old Testament. Moreover, God said to Moses, Elohim, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Jehovah Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Isaac, the Elohim of Jacob, saying, I am still the God, they're not dead, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. That is his name. The I am that I am will be the name forever. When God says forever, he means forever, always. Nobody's going to touch his name. There is one God. His name is Elohim. He is in the form of one God and three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we see in the original Hebrew. Uh, so God has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. All generations will know of the Passover. All generations will know of the story of Moses, how he delivered my people to, from, from Pharaoh of Egypt, supernaturally, the superpower of the world, the Pharaoh and his Egyptians, and their ten gods. I conquered because I am that I am, and I say what my word, and I mean what I say, and I say what I mean, and I'm going to deliver my people because my name is great. My name is great, but my word is even greater because what I say I'm going to do, I'm going to do. So uh, verse 17, I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The Jebusites are the area of Jerusalem. They didn't have Jerusalem yet. It, and uh, that's where um, Abraham uh, tithed to Melchizedek. Melchizedek is a title according to the book of Yasser. And Melchizedek was first with, with Shem. Uh, and uh, so Christ will be in the order of Melchizedek and instead of the, 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 uh, the, 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 uh, the priestly line of the Torah, which was the, the Levites. Jesus is above that. He is our king and priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. So in the, to the land flowing with milk and honey, the, the, the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God makes a promise, he's going to fulfill it. And he's going to make promises here to Moses about what's going to happen next and how the, the, the Egyptians are going to give them money to leave, leave and let his, their people go. And when Moses goes through these trials and tribulations, he's probably thinking, how the heck is this ever going to work? But God is telling us in Exodus 3, Elohim, that it's going to happen. And when God says it's going to happen, you can take it to the bank, it's going to happen. So all the prophecies that have not come fulfilled yet by his prophets. You can take it to the bank. They're going to happen. We know what the, the, tomorrow's news is going to be before it happens because God's word is above his name. So then they will heed to your voice and shall come. You, you and all the elders of Israel, the king of Egypt, and you shall say to them, the Jehovah, your Elohim of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Jehovah, our Elohim. Three days, another again, foreshadowing of Christ. Uh, died according to the scripture, buried, went into the Sheol, taking the, the uh, Abraham's bosom uh, saints up to uh, heaven, the heavenly realm for the first time with him as he was resurrected on the third day. No coincidence. Three days it took Abraham to go to Mount Moriah to test him whether he would, he would uh, give up Isaac. And that was a foreshadowing that God the Father would give up his only begotten son. Three days into the land, or on the, uh, on, through uh, the, the resurrection of Christ, and on Mount Moriah. There is no coincidence when it comes to God's word. It is truth. So these things are going to happen. So if you read this, and you're thinking, well, this is going to happen fast. This is what God says. Well, when God tells you he's going to do something, it usually doesn't happen fast. You, that's why you have to have patience, and you have to have trust. He's not just going to put Moses in front of him and say, this, thus says the Lord, and, Moses, and Pharaoh's going to say, okay, well, here you go. Pharaoh has a hardened heart. So he's, God is going to test each one of the Egyptian gods with one of the plagues. So that's key. They have 10 gods. 
and 10 is the number of, of commandments and the number of judgments. That's where we get this from because the Egyptians had 10 gods and the last god was Pharaoh thought he was God above all and that's why the, the Passover was the last of God's judgments on there. So Moses and Aaron are going to have to go through some trials and tribulations in the test of, being, of each of the gods are to come. But I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you. Uh, but I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. So he's going to have a hardened heart for God's purpose. Everything works to the good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. He had a purpose for each and everything. We may not see it today. We may not understand it, but we have to trust it as we see God work through Exodus, through Moses, as we see him work through David, as we see him work through all the scripture. We look back on it and, and we say, wow, there was absolutely a purpose for every single thing he did. And that's why we have to have patience in our times of trials and tribulations and trust him that is for his good. And we love him and all things work to his good and for his glory. And we will fulfill it and we will be obedient and we'll trust in the Lord and we will finish the race. So, um, but I am sure that the king will not let you go. Verse 20. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders. We come in with the 10 plagues, uh, which I will do in the midst. And after that, he will let you go. So uh, you're going to have to go through all 10. Uh, he's going to be hard in heart. Then he'll let you go. I'm telling you, he's going to let you go. And Moses and, and Aaron are probably thinking during the middle of this, he's never going to let him go. He's never going to let him go, but God said he's going to let him go, and God has complete control. And it had to be a process. It had to eliminate and show each of the gods of the Egyptians were no gods, and there was only one God. His name is Elohim, the I am that I am, as Jesus said seven times uh, in the book of, of, of uh, the Gospel of John. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. Not only will you let them go, and I will destroy, destroy their crops and the firstborn, because he's trying to destroy my firstborn. Remember the Pharaoh before tried to destroy Moses as the firstborn. He, and Satan did that then. And Satan tried to do that again with the Messiah, the Christ. This is foreshadowing exactly what would happen under the days of Herod to try to kill the anointed one that was coming on to the earth, the Messiah, the, the, Jesus Christ. And uh, so he, you're, he, not only that, but he says, you're not going to go away empty handed. Not only are they, I'm going to persecute them with plagues because of their hardened heart and their false idols and their wicked uh, gods, but they're going to give you silver and gold and send you out with, 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 with a beautiful bounty because I am the God of the universe. I am that I am. I am Elohim. And we close out in verse 22. But every woman shall ask for of her neighbor, namely of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver, articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. And Moses, we've got to remember this word because God promised this. And when we go through our trials and tribulations in our life, Write down those times where God gave you a promise. Write down those times that God gave promises to Moses, gave promises to David. And even though they were going through trials and tribulations, it looked like there would never come, to, come away. It would, it would need a miracle, as we're going to see, the parting of the Red Sea. Moses is sitting there just trapped between a mountain and an ocean, and we'll, or a mountain and a great sea. And what does God do? He parts the sea because there's nothing that I am that I am can't do. So when he tells you he's going to do it, you may go through some trials and tribulations, but you trust and love your God because your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great God, the only God, the one God who is supreme over all things through the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. We give him glory and we give him praise always and we trust in him and love him with all our heart our soul, and our mind. We pray that Exodus 3 has been a blessing to you. And may the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses bless you today and always. God bless you.